So let's talk a little bit about ADHD. So ADHD, when you are passionate about what you're doing, I've been working on this project for 10 hours straight. I've accomplished in one day what would take a normal person an entire week. Nothing can stop me. I'm a god. And ADHD, when you aren't passionate about what you're doing. Washing dish is very hard, right? So this is like a pretty funny meme. Um, I think that part of the reason that these memes get made and the reason that they propagate, right, and get a bunch of upvotes is because people can really... Uh, um, identify with this experience. like the, So a lot of people with ADHD will be aware that their attention can sometimes get hyper-focused on a particular thing. And if that thing happens to be something good for them, they like can really do an awesome job. Like if they, they can get super caught up in particular things, learn a lot about stuff, um, you know, like get super into crypto, for example, and then like read crypto stuff for like 10 hours and like learn a ton about crypto. And then the, the challenge, though, is that it's not really your choice what you choose to hyper-focus on. And so it feels a little bit like a roll of the dice where, like, if it's, if it's a good thing to get hyper-focused on, that's awesome, right? And then we're over here on the left. And if it's not a good thing to focus on, then you kind of wind up on the right. So we're going to talk a little bit about this phenomenon. But before we do, I want to share actually a post, um, which we're not going to go over the whole thing because it's, it's relatively long. Uh, but I think that it's actually like a really good post. So someone in our community a few days ago mentioned that they had serious concerns about your ADHD is it actually an advantage video. And so, um, you know, they go on to sort of talk a lot about myths, some of which I kind of talk about. They also cite, um, you know, Dr. Russell Barkley, who's an expert on ADHD. And, and so they're sort of sharing some of the concerns about the ways that we represent ADHD or we talk about ADHD. For what it's worth, I, I kind of responded to the post and stuff like that, and some of the things that I sort of said about some of the other videos, and I sort of said, I, I completely understand your criticism. Uh, for what it's worth, we're going to be like revisiting, or we've already started the process of revisiting how we title our videos. Um, so that feedback has been really, really useful because I think this person had a super, super valid point. And so hopefully as a result of this feedback, um, you know, will improve and therefore we'll be able to help more people. So we're always open to feedback for people who are sort of telling us, hey, we think you should be doing this better. Um, and we have concerns about this and this. And as long as it sort of supports the mission of what we're trying to accomplish at HG, we're more than happy to receive it. In fact, we depend on it, right? That's how we've gotten to where we are today is based on the feedback of, of the people that support the, the work that we do. So, um, so the, then the, part of what this kind of comes down to is there's this idea that if we kind of go back to this meme that like, if you have ADHD and you're passionate about something, and if you get kind of like into something that you can spend 10 hours straight doing it. So this is where it's really important to remember that ADHD is a, is a diagnosis of disordered attention, right? So disordered attention, what most people think of with ADHD is that you can't focus on a particular thing and that your mind is very distractible and wanders. But when we talk about disordered attention, and this is really common, I remember talking especially to parents who have adolescent kids who, when I mentioned ADHD as a potential diagnosis, the parents would be super surprised. And they're like, well, you know, we didn't, he can, our kid can like sit down and, and read a comic books for like eight hours straight. So if he's capable of doing that, like, doesn't that mean it's not ADHD? And so ADHD is a disordered attention. And what we mean by disordered attention is not only that you can't force your mind to focus on what you want it to, and instead it gets distracted, but the opposite is also true, which I think we've mentioned several times on stream, is that sometimes you get stuck on a particular thing and you can't shake that thought when it's really a good idea to shake that thought. And at the same time, we also have you know some interesting... Um, perspectives on this. So like, here's a, here's an example of, so the, the person thankfully, you know, mentioned Russell Barkley and I'm, I was somewhat familiar with his work, but as a consequence of, of, um, the posters feedback. So I, I looked at a lot more of his work and I, I kind of, uh, uh I want to share with y'all a quote from Russell Barkley, or I, I think, can we watch YouTube or does it get banned? We can watch YouTube, right? So here, here's, Russell there's Barkley also talking. another popular phrase in some of the adult ADHD trade books, adults with ADHD are good at hyper-focusing. This, too, is mythology. Hyperfocusing is actually perseveration. 
you are unable to interrupt what you're doing when you should have shifted to doing something else. It is like the child who continues to play the video game long after they should have been getting dressed for school and out to the bus. You want to call that hyperfocusing? That's fine, but that is a classic sign of a frontal lobe injury, and it is perseverative responding. You should have stopped what you're doing, and you didn't. There were other, more important goals to have been accomplished, and you ignored them. This is no gift. It is, in fact, a symptom of this disorder. Hyperfocusing goes with autism. Perseveration goes with ADHD. There's a little bit of a context there, um, which is he, I think he's answering a question about the difference between perseveration and hyperfocusing. But I think he brings up a really excellent point. And the challenge is that, you know, if you talk to people with ADHD, and I've certainly been in this camp, um, despite the fact that hyperfocusing is an attribute of a disorder, you're going to have people who have this experience, right? Whatever you call it, this injury slash gift has been responsible for every single achievement in my life. And this is also why we have these kinds of memes, because the experience of people with ADHD is, um, for some of those people, the hyper-focusing seems to be an advantage. And as we sort of start to look a, a little bit at the research, um, you know, there's some talk about neurodiversity, for example. So like there's a growing movement within the mental health field that um, some of these things may not be, shouldn't, it, it's not appropriate to categorize them as illnesses, but this, this is a situation of neurodiverse versus neurotypical. Um, I have my reservations about some of these concepts, which we'll kind of get to in a second. But, you know, there seems to be like some exploration of what we've traditionally thought of is, is mental illnesses and whether some of these mental illnesses can possibly have good effects, right? So we have some experts like Russell Barkley that say that this is hands down kind of a, the, the myth of hyperfocus is, is in a sense false. Um, this is a sign of a, like it's, it's correlated with a frontal lobe injury, which is absolutely correct. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, useful stuff that he has to say, but there are different perspectives. So this is a paper that was um, published in Neuroscience and Behavioral Reviews that sort of examined creativity and ADHD um, and was sort of looking at, it was a review that looked at 31 studies and sort of like went over, you know, what is the relationship between ADHD and, and creativity? And essentially, like, th there's a lot of like mixed stuff in here. I think a lot of the conclusions that they come to are somewhat questionable. Um, but there are a few interesting findings from, from th this study. So one is that um, most studies find evidence for increased divergent thinking for those with high ADHD scores, but not for those with the disorder, clinical. So what does this mean? So we're going to unpack this statement a little bit. So divergent thinking is essentially correlated with like, or that's how they sort of describe or try to measure creativity. So when I sort of have a particular, I'm faced with a particular problem, generally speaking, we tend to, um, you know, approach it a particular way. And people who think divergently will be able to like draw on different kinds of perspectives or think about it in, in a non-standard way. So this is, so is sometimes used in the literature as a correlation for um, uh, creativity. And so what one of the main findings of this review is that like there are people who score highly in terms of ADHD symptoms that don't quite meet a clinical threshold. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, but when you sort of cross over into the clinical threshold, the apparent benefits of ADHD aren't really measurable. Uh, so and another sort of major movement in the realm of ADHD research is sort of this general call for more research opportunities to boost the knowledge needed to better understand the potential positive side of ADHD. And this is something that is not, you know, this is not, these are not the only people that are sort of saying this. So this is another paper that sort of looks, this is qualitative research. So these were people that were kind of doing, instead of like administering instruments and stuff like that. Um, they sat down with, I think, just a handful of people, like a really small sample size. And they sort of asked them questions about, you know, like, what, what is your experience of ADHD? And like, you know, what are some of the advantages, things like that? And so what they sort of discovered is that, you know, there's some amount of divergent thinking or creativity, that there is a hy hyper focus element, um, that there's a cognitive dynamism, which is sort of like a positive thing, like sort of a sense of adventurousness, 
So this is another example of um, you know some of the research that's sort of starting to explore potential good sides of ADHD. And we'll talk a little bit about you know what exactly ADHD is and why there are these disparate perspectives. Um, so the, there are lots of po papers about this kind of stuff. And so you know what I'd like to share with you all today is just how I understand ADHD and why I think there are so many different perspectives. So let's start by sort of summarizing what are the different perspectives. So on the one hand, you have people like Russell Barkley or a lot of clinicians, including myself, sort of, that clearly acknowledge that ADHD is a disorder, right? So like in the field of psychiatry, we diagnose things that are disorders. And by definition, they're sort of impairments of function. Now, the interesting thing is on the other side, we've got people who, um, ba like, so we'll have people on the internet, right? So like, like the, the random person, which is not data, it's just like one person's experience, who says it's my ability to hyper-focus that has allowed me to like achieve everything that I have in life. And I've certainly worked with patients who um, have that perspective as well, where they've really found that kind of getting control of their ADHD and sort of playing to the benefit of their capacity to hyper-focus. There are even some papers, but I, I really didn't think these were very rigorous, that sort of equate the hyper-focus of ADHD to the flow state, which I think is actually quite different. But there are definitely a lot of people, myself included, who have um, somewhat ADHD minds. Like, I'm pretty sure that if I was a kid and I ever got evaluated for ADHD, I, like, I'm pretty sure that I would have been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, so just thinking through the diagnostic criteria, like, I think I check a lot of those boxes. But I think that I fall under the category of people who are a little bit more subclinical. And so what does that mean? So I think a lot of the reason that we have such a diverse perspective on ADHD is because... When we think about ADHD in the Western medical sense, when you think about Western medical diagnosis, it's binary, right? So what we do in, in psychiatry is like, we diagnose you or we don't diagnose you. So this is just the structure of our medical field. It's not necessarily true. It's just how we've organized medicine. So if I were to ask you, like, you know, like if, if we we're investigating, like, let's say someone who's passed away and someone will say, what was the cause of death? And like the coroner will say it was a myocardial infarction. It was a heart attack. So this is the kind of thing where like in medicine, we tend to label things in a binary way, whether you like meet criteria for the disorder or you don't meet the criteria for the disorder. Practically, clinically, it's not quite as binary, right? So if you diagnose with someone with depression, everyone knows, or major depressive disorder, everyone knows both patients and clinicians especially that there's severities of major depressive disorder, right? Not all major depressive disorder are created equally. And similarly with ADHD, I think a big part of this problem is that ADHD is actually a spectrum. It isn't a homogenous disease that affects people homogeneously. So as a result, like this is sort of an artificiality, uh, artificial binary like imposement that we're doing on ADHD. And so then what happens is we get disparate perspectives because we've actually got a bell curve of ADHD symptoms and people are at different places in terms of the severity of their ADHD, how beneficial their ADHD is. And we'll kind of talk about that in a second. And so I think the simplest reason that we get some of the, these disparate perspectives is it's not that one person is right and one person is wrong. I think my experience as a clinician has been that, you know, people tend to experience mental health in a very individual way. Um, but that there's actually a perspective, uh, you know, there's a scale of different perspectives. And this is part of the reason that, you know, when I first started talking about ADHD, I, I talked a lot about Ayurveda because I had personally found that the Ayurvedic conception of ADHD fit better, uh, 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 was a better fit for people's experiences than actually like the Western binary sort of perspective on ADHD. Part of the reason that we've sort of scaled back on our Ayurvedic discussion recently is there was once again another post that offered a lot of really good criticisms about some of the scientific studies we were citing and the low quality of those studies. So I don't know if y'all have noticed, but we've sort of taken a step back from Ayurveda. That doesn't mean that we aren't, we're actually actively revisiting it. So we're sort of looking through the research and really trying to, to read tons and tons of articles to really figure out, okay, what is it, what can we say that's like sort of scientifically valid and like, you know, what is like more of our interpretation, which by the way, I'm totally fine doing, right? So I'm totally fine on stream and I, I hope, you know, I make this pretty clear that sometimes what I'm saying is very supported by science. Sometimes what I'm saying is more supported by clinical experience. And sometimes what I'm saying is not based on medicine or science at all, but is more personal or spiritual in nature. 
And I think a lot of the people that appreciate our community are, are ones that sort of appreciate the spectrum because there are different ways of looking at things. And so kind of going back to ADHD, I think the, the challenge is that there are, you know, a spectrum of different experiences. Um, as a result, people are going to have different perspectives on how impairing ADHD is. And so I think the, the important thing to kind of remember, there are a few important takeaways. The, the first is that ADHD is a spectrum. Um, and the part of the reason that, you know, this spectrum exists is because there are some components of ADHD that may be, or of the ADHD spectrum, let's, let's not even call it the, the ADHD spectrum. So there are components of the attentional spectrum, which can be beneficial to human beings. And this is where even if you look at other illnesses, there are cases where illnesses can form advantages for people. Now, we're not, I don't think, for example, that it's necessarily good to have an illness. I think generally speaking, if you get diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder, on balance, that is going to hurt you significantly more than it will help you. That being said, there are some advantages. So, for example, when I was working in the Massachusetts General Hospital emergency room, we saw a lot of students from Harvard and MIT and what we sort of observed is, I don't know if there's published research about this, but talking to people at MIT Health Services and Harvard Health Services is that there, the prevalence of type 2 bipolar disorder at Ivy League institutions or very competitive institutions seem to be significantly higher than the average population. And when I talked to these kids who were like, you know, undergrads at, at MIT, like they were terrified of, of getting their bipolar disorder treated. Why is that? Because their bipolar disorder, type 2 bipolar, allowed them to sleep for two to four hours a night and be able to be like focused and very like action-oriented and study a lot and things like that. And a lot of them were actually really reluctant to engage in treatment because they had found some advantages to the way that their bipolar disorder worked. Now, once again, on balance, it was my kind of experience. And generally speaking, you know, I, I would recommend, strongly recommend treatment to these people because even though there may be particular situations in which a particular mental illness offers an advantage, on the whole, it's like it hurts more than helps. So like, sure, you're sleeping two to four hours a night for the two weeks before finals because you're hypomanic and it helps you do well on your finals. But then for the next three months, six months, you're, you crash, you go into a deep depression, and your grades the next semester are absolute trash because, like, you know, you're depressed. So, so e even though an illness may have particular advantages in particular cases, that on balance it's been my overwhelming experience as a clinician, that you don't really, it's not worth it, essentially. And so the, the kind of the next thing that I want to talk about, so just to review a little bit about what we talked about. So the first is why is there, you know, why do people share these different perspectives? Um, and that's because I think that, you know, illnesses are not homogenous, right? And depending on who you're talking to and what the experience of that person is, um, there you're going to get sort of different answers. And the second point is that I think there is some evidence that irrespective of what the mental illness is, that there are some components of those fundamental functions which can be beneficial. So even if we look at something like depression in the default mode network. So one of my one of the hypotheses that I kind of subscribe to is that major depressive disorder involves hyperactivation of this part of our brain called the default mode network. And the default mode network is the part of our brain. It's not really a place. It's a network. Um, so it's not localized to like a particular anatomical region, is responsible for self-reflection. So it gives us the ability to think about ourselves. And when people get depressed, they get stuck thinking about only themselves themselves in a negative way. So it's sort of a hyperactivation of that. But the default mode network is actually a really useful part of our brain. And if we look at what mental illness is, it tends to be that our brain sort of functions a particular way. And then if parts of our brain become hyperactive or hypoactive, or even the, as a human being, we interact in a particular social circumstance or an environmental circumstance that sort of exposes some of the vulnerabilities of, of however our brain functions, then we can get diagnosed with the disorder. A good example of this, for example, uh, is that, you know, kids are more likely to be uh, diagnosed with ADHD if the ratio of students to teachers in a classroom is bad. So if there's tons of students and very few teachers, you're more likely to diagnose kids with ADHD than if the student-teacher ratio is more favorable. 
right? So that sort of suggests to us that people will present for psychiatric help. It's not just what's going on in your brain. It's brain plus circumstance. And that theory, by the way, I think is relatively well supported. So when we think a little bit about psychiatric illness, even things like major depressive disorder, oftentimes what we'll find is that there's a genetic predisposition or maybe a family history, and then a particular circumstance triggers the depression, right? So like you were totally fine until the age of 26 when you got fired from your job and then, you know, your partner broke up with you and then you had to move back home with your parents and that sort of triggered the depression. Now, did those sort of cause the depression? Sure. But then, then what happens is like there's an independent neurochemical process which starts in your brain, which may go beyond the circumstances. So then let's say you start dating again and you find a new job and you move out of your parents' place, but you still feel super depressed. That's a good example of separating out you know, the disease from the general trigger from the disease. Another thing about the researcher on ADHD is that I think that, as people sort of pointed out when they were kind of, um, if you look at some of these papers on, you know, creativity and stuff, one of the things that they point out is that research opportunities to boost the knowledge needed to better, better understand the positive, potential positive side of ADHD, there are almost always calls for, you know, more, um, uh, more over the sizable prevalence of hyperfocus in adults with high levels of ADHD symptomology leads to the need to study it as a potential separable feature from ADHD, right? So generally speaking, a lot of people are call, calling for more research on the positives of ADHD. And why is that? It's because generally speaking, when we look at studying an illness, the first kind of selection bias tends to be towards the sickest people. So another good example of this is like, if you look at the research on sociopathy, a lot of the conclusions that we draw on sociopathy are based on populations where you can find and recruit sociopathic individuals. And can anyone guess where is the largest, most consistent population of sociopathic inter individuals that you can easily recruit for studies? Prisons, right? And so as a result, what we've got in our research is that we're studying like the, the, our inclusion criteria and stuff like that, right? Because you've got to think a little bit about the perspective of a researcher. If I want to conduct a study on ADHD, am I more likely to take someone who's definitely got ADHD or someone who's kind of on the border, right? So I'm, my inclusion criteria are going to be like relatively strict in terms of like I definitely want people who I know have ADHD, because that's how we're going to learn about the illness. And the truth is that somewhere in that middle ground, those people may actually have ADHD, but it's just less of a clear-cut decision, requires like a full clinical evaluation, which by the way, when people are recruiting for studies, they don't do usually do full clinical evaluations with neuropsych testing and all that kind of stuff, right? So they usually like will use some kinds of standardized instruments, you fill a couple forms, and if your numbers are super high, you get enrolled in the study. Drug manufacturers, by the way, also do this because there's evidence that shows that, for example, the sicker you are, the more antidepressant medication helps. And so what they'll tend to do is if they want to show a big benefit, if they say that this is going to make your depression, you know, way better, the larger, largest benefits are going to tend to be seen in the sickest number of people. So another simple example of this is let's say I've got, you know, a 101 fever and a 103 fever and I take antipyretic medication. Both of those, in both of those cases, chances are the antipyretic medication is going to break my fever and bring me back down to 98.6. But if I'm a drug manufacturer, I can say that the effect size is way better if I recruit people who are like 103, right? So now I can show a larger magnitude of change. So I think another big bias that is in our research, which I don't, I don't blame it, like this is where we've got to start somewhere, right? is that if you look at like studies on ADHD, they tend to focus on the sicker people. They tend not to focus on this kind of subclinical population. If you call it subclinical, that means that they may not even meet the disorder, the criteria for the disorder, or they may, may meet the criteria for the disorder. So I personally, as a psychiatrist, have seen a ton of people who um, meet criteria for the disorder, but can actually manage and, and even utilize some of the dynamic nature of their mind. It's something that I myself have sort of learned how to manage. And by the way, 
um, you know, there are studies that show that kind of behavioral interventions or psychotherapy interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy can be just as efficacious as medication in treating ADHD. And I've had a lot of experience with people who, you know, once they sort of understand how to manage their ADHD can actually like perform really, really well. And I will hear these kinds of things where people will say, you know, I'm really glad actually my, my you know, the dynamic nature of my mind really manages, helps me keep up with a lot of stuff. So I'll give you guys just one quick example of a friend of mine who, um, you know, we went to medical school together and then they really found they struggled a lot because they had ADHD. And so they actually left medicine and moved into the field of commercial real estate. And what they really found is that like all of the ways in which their difficulty sitting there and reading a book um, was a handicap in the field of medicine, which it absolutely was. Their brain was not functioning the way that most of their colleagues were actually seemed to them subjectively to be an advantage in the field of like commercial real estate because they could manage like a thousand different tasks. They were really good at multitasking. Interestingly enough, they could also read contracts that were 50 pages long. So I don't really understand what happened there. Um, but the, the point here is that, you know, people have diverse experiences. I've also had patients who are the very opposite of that and that ADHD for them is absolutely a disorder absolutely an impairment and absolutely like wrecks every dimension of their life. So this is not just like affecting their professional life or academic life, but really impacts their relationships because when their partner tells them, Hey, are you going to go to the grocery store? And they're not paying attention. And they say, yeah, I'm going to go. And they're like, can you please pick up these three things? And they said, yeah, okay, sure. They're, they think they're paying attention, but they're not paying attention. And then like six hours later when it's dinner time, and then the sp like partner asks them, Hey, like, where's that stuff? And they're like, what stuff? And they're like, the stuff that you said you were going to go get. What? What are you talking about? Right? So th this is where it's like, it's okay for ADHD to be sort of a spectrum. And it's okay for people to have different experiences of it. And if you are someone who is concerned that you have ADHD, what should you do about it? Right? So like, what do I know? To, what should I believe? Should I believe Russell Barkley, a random person on the internet, this paper that talks about ADHD as a potential source of increased creativity, like, what should I believe? And this is where I'd say at the end of the day, like, you have to kind of decide for yourself, right? Because it is a spectrum. Not all, all illnesses are the same within all people. So uh, depression is going to manifest in a discrete and unique way in every single person that's ever lived. Because the way that that, that illness manifests is shaped by your personal experiences, your history, you know, your background, your coping mechanisms, your strengths, your support structures. And that's why we have clinicians, at least so far, instead of robots. Why do we have clinicians? It's because it takes a human being to integrate all of this research and sort of apply it to you and sort of figure out, okay, for your individual situation, which are the research studies that are the most applicable? And so what I'd recommend to anyone out there who is, you know, concerned that they may have ADHD is I wouldn't default to believing that this is necessarily going to be an advantage. There's also a lot of like psychological stuff about, you know, like not wanting to believe that you are ill in some way or coming to terms with the fact that if you do have an illness like that just sucks and it's a straight negative. And this is where like we want to believe, you know, that the world is an equal place. We as a society, should we strive to make it equal? Absolutely. But, you know, as a medical doctor, like, I don't know if I believe that the world and the universe is an equal place. I mean, I've seen, like, kids, eight-year-olds diagnosed with cancer, and I don't think that, like, buying the childhood cancer flaw during character creation necessarily gives you, like, points elsewhere. Sometimes those kids happen to be poor. Sometimes those kids happen to have an abusive parent. And it's not like I, I really wish it was, I wish that every human being on the planet had the same pool of points for character creation. But the sad truth is that that's not how it is. And so some people really want to believe that like there's some silver lining to their experience. And there may be, I don't, I don't really know. But I think at the end of the day, what you've really got to do is if you're concerned about it, first of all, go see a licensed clinician, right? I talk a lot about the benefits of our coaching program, but this is not really appropriate for coaching. Go see a licensed clinician, someone who's actually trained in mental health stuff and try to figure out, okay, like, do I actually have, do I meet the threshold for a clinical diagnosis? Furthermore, even if you do meet a, the, clinic, uh, the threshold for a clinical diagnosis, that does not, you know, that's not, does, doesn't set your life in stone. 
Like there, you, you may fall into the category of people who, first of all, don't need medication or can manage their symptoms without medication. You may be able to, you know, get control of the hyper-focus in a way that I've seen my patients sometimes do, for lack of a better term. Or you may be part of the, the group that, you know, can't get control of your hyper-focus and your hyper-focus is a straight negative. Or, which is more, much more common, and I'd say the most common, is that at times the hyperfocus works in your favor, and at times the hyperfocus really doesn't work in your favor. Kind of like the example that Russell Barkley was talking about, which is like, yeah, you're playing video games and you really should have gotten up and, and gotten onto the bus. And so at the end of the day, ADHD is, is, in my opinion, a much more diverse and poorly understood disease than we sometimes give it credit for. I absolutely believe that there is, you know, a threshold beyond which it is a disorder and on balance negatively impacts your life. But just because it on balance negative imp negatively impacts your life doesn't mean that you can't learn to live with it, learn to either reduce the symptoms or even develop or extract some kinds of positives from your illness experience. And the last example about that that I'll share with y'all is I've worked with a couple of people who are artists. And sometimes as I talk to them about, you know, their experience of depression, I'll sort of describe them as having what I call the artistic temperament, that I genuinely do believe that a lot of the, the wonderful creative work that is done by musicians I've worked with, um, budding authors, I should say, um, you know, and, and I really hope they become successful authors one day. But what I've really come to appreciate about some of their work is that their personal experiences of mental health allow them to describe like emotionally and limbically, like the experience, the difficult experience of being a human being. And so that translates into their music, that translates into their writing, that translates into, you know, filmmaking. And so as a result, like, it's not that it's all negative. I mean, they're, they're definitely, it's, it's part of who you are, right? And this is, I think, ultimately the way that I view mental illness, which is that it's not like discrete, like, sure, does it impair your function? Absolutely. But as a human being, you are a constellation of all of your pieces. And some of your pieces are going to screw you over more than other pieces. You're going to have some advantages. You're going to have some disadvantages. And just because something is an illness doesn't mean that it can't be, you know, a part of your life. And the only solution is to, like, rip it out root and stem. I know a lot of people who have come to live with their mental illness in a very healthy and productive way. Not saying that it should be untreated. In fact, the majority of those people who do learn how to like, you know, live healthily with their mental illness, do so through treatment. And just as in a quick, you know, reminder of a source that we've already mentioned, um, I want to just highlight this sentence here. So we found no evidence for increased convergent thinking abilities in ADHD, nor did we find an overall negative effect of psychostimulants on creativity. So I think this is a really important statement to understand. And this is what, you know, for all the people that I worked with who were undergrads, you know, in, in Boston, that were had type 2 bipolar disorder, this is the main conclusion, is that you may think that treatment of your thing will, you will lose the advantages, but in my overwhelming experience, getting treatment for your mental illness is going to be like a net positive, right? It's not like you're going to lose the person that you are. It may take a little while. So this is like my experience with people with bipolar disorder who are artists. It takes time and more effort to find your creative process again. Right. Like just because you're an artist who goes on manic binges and like paints a bunch of like really drastic stuff. And then if you start treating your bipolar disorder, like the people will come to me and they'll be like, I can't paint anymore. And it's like it, it can feel that way. And then sometimes they make the mistake of going off of treatment. But in my overwhelming experience, it's just about re-accessing that, that part of yourself because mental illness is about a loss of control of the mind. Right. Being able to focus for 10 hours is not a bad thing. It's the inability to choose what you focus on, when you focus on it for 10 hours, that's the bad thing. That's when the illness gets the best of you, right? So a big part of learning to live with mental illness is sometimes our mental illness gives us a shortcut and can give us advantages. We see that with the type 2 of bipolar disorder too, where it's like these people are relying on the, the hypomania to help them study. Whereas like if you start treating your bipolar disorder, the hypomania won't let you study, but it's not like you, can, you can't study without hypomania, right? It's just like you're going to have to learn some new skills because it's almost like you've been using a little bit of this automatic, you know, type two, main, uh, type 2 bipolar disorder crutch or this ADHD crutch or whatever. So it can definitely be an uphill battle. It can be difficult. 
But at the end of the day, it's almost always or just just about always worth getting treatment. Because the truth is you're not going to lose the good parts of you if you enter into psychiatric treatment. In fact, what's probably going to happen is the opposite, is that it may be a little bit of an uphill climb for a little while. There may be a little bit of, uh, of a learning curve. But it's been my overwhelming experience that at the end of that climb, people are way happier and really glad they engaged in treatment.